Um, I don't know if you're aware, but on Wednesday of this week, we fly out to Uganda. So we're going to just tell you, well, I'm going to tell you what took us the first time to Uganda, and then Ken will tell you more about what will happen this time, maybe. Okay, so between 2011 and 2016, Ken and I went each year for up to six months as self-supporting missionaries to the Middle East with um, an organisation called MECO, which was Middle Eastern Christian Outreach. We worked in Cairo as teachers in a refugee school for African refugees, and you can see them. Well, I'm in that first picture, I'm in there teaching, and the second one are the students that Ken taught. Okay, now we see if this works. Do I press here? Kazito. <laughs> and he became a very good friend. Soon afterwards, we decided not to return to Cairo, and we went back to Uganda. He and Kazito went back to Uganda. And he married Sylvia. So there's Sylvia. And Kazito and Sylvia had a burning desire to evangelize and teach the at risk children of their village. Their problem was, and it still is, that they are full time independent kingdom workers who are not connected to an organization. Kazito asked us to come to Uganda to give teacher training. Our years at African Hope Refugee School had taught us that one can't just come in and put a Western education system down on top of whatever's there. You have to go and look and see and you have to adapt. And so, in 2019, we went to survey the scene. And things are not, or if not everything was easy. If I'm working it, oh, oh, well. There we go. Oh, thank you. Am I just waving my hand? Okay, so, all right. Um, there was a daily 30 minute ride um, to the village where Casino was working, and the drivers, um, the buses were really overcrowded and they made really scary overtakes. I don't know if you can see there on there. Um, the buildings where we taught at that time had no electricity, they had leaky roofs. The chickens ran across the dirt floors and there were no windows or doors. And the, the part of my day which I most hated was when I had to go to the squat toilet and there was just that very little small hole um, and you can see the damp areas around it and the broom that was used to brush the bits that didn't make it. <laughs> um, as, as, back one, as requested, we took with us a case full of resources, because he has got the case carrying it, um, with Ken then walking up to the school. Um, these resources were scoured from op shops. And we were able to buy some things in Uganda, like coloured pencils and wall maps and posters, and um, they were all cheap. But you couldn't buy books written in English, you couldn't buy textbooks unless you pay at least Australian prices. Um, and that's partly because there are no second-hand bookshops for books, second-hand bookshops in Uganda. They do not exist. Um, I was able to give Sylvia some very basic phonics training and I taught her how to make wooden jigsaw puzzles in the hope that they might become an income source. And over our years on the mission field, our focus has changed from what we could do on the field to what we could do to support young nationals committed to evangelism. With this in mind, it was our intention to return to Uganda the following year, that is 2020, but COVID struck and much has happened between then and now. Just to give you an idea of where we're talking about, the top marker is the capital Kampala, and it's a four hour bus ride down to the next town, and then there are about another 30 kilometres out in the rural area. There was quite renowned that area for high HIV rates. And because of those HIV rates, there are a lot of orphans being brought up by elderly grandparents and so on, because their parents both died of HIV. So that's who he's ministering with. Um, he started by teaching Sunday school in the local Catholic church building, which you can see is um, 
very not like our Catholic church buildings. <laughs> and there's his Sunday school class, and they sort of do a lot of praying and singing, and but it's a lot done outside because of the scarcity of resources. And you can see that when we talk time, space, and resources, which is one of the things I use in education to work out whether something's likely to actually happen well. Do you have enough time? Do you have enough space? And do you have enough resources? Human and physical. We sort of think, like on the left-hand side of these classrooms with wall posters and so on. Yeah, thanks. And we also think of technology, but the reality for a lot of people in Uganda is that they think one blackboard, 50 kids and a tree. So they have the time, they sort of have the space, and they have no resources. And that's been a challenge. So somewhere along the line we thought it would be really good if they actually had somewhere to live and somewhere to teach. And that's the block of land they had, which is basically a farm with some existing fruit trees. And on the right you can see a house with an outside teaching space. So that they can be undercover and have kids at their home. I'm not sure if you can see that, but there's in a Ugandan culture you can't stay overnight unless you're in a relative's place. That meant that we had no capacity to visit because there's no accommodation in the area. And so we actually have a guest room there which has its own entrance and bathroom. And that's where we're going to be planted for seven weeks. <coughs> Everything's a challenge. COVID brought its own challenges. There's a the kids lining up under a sort of a water tank with a, a pretend tap. But water itself is a scarce resource in that area of Uganda, especially in the dry season. And you can see he's using the house partly as a teaching space, but what it's missing is furniture. <laughs> okay. Um, over the last three years, I, I spent a lot of time in op shops looking for really good stuff at a really cheap price. In the last three years, we've sent a lot of resources like all those books and games across. The main cost is actually postage. So that's been good. Um, eventually, we had a water tank as well. Please pray for rain. At the moment, only the tank on the top has water. The dry season of about three months is coming. And there's showers forecast next week. But they reckon if it doesn't rain next week, it won't be raining. And so water would be scarce. There we go. We're also on the move to try and see if they can be more financially independent, and that's another block of land that's been bought. The aim to grow coffee, because that seems about the only traditional thing you can do that spins a decent income. But we're not sure if it's going to work or not. And in the meantime, they have a new responsibility. Um, because Edo Bradley is about six months old. He's dressed up there in some of the clothes people kind of go to send across. But it means that they've got new responsibilities. Um, next one, thank you. Even getting a bed is a big, big deal because you can't buy anything except in Kampala, basically. That's been made by the local carpenter from just a picture. And so we at least have a bed. You will notice that we don't have a bed. <laughs> So, so when we get to Kampala, where the airport is, we've, we've really got three choices for shopping. You can go to a local village shop and buy water and a few bitties or something. That doesn't get you very far. The town that's 30 kilometres away is the one on the right hand side. That's Masaka. And it, whilst it looks busy, it really just sells stationary clothes and basic groceries. A bit of hardware. So the bottom is the newly opened Carrefour supermarket and anyone who's been to a Carrefour supermarket around the world knows that that is like shopping heaven for people who can't get stuff because they have everything from electronics and so on. But we're hoping that we're going to spend two and a half days shopping because we get one chance in the seven weeks to buy all the things that could never be bought and that are needed. For example, a tape measure he needed to measure the room his solution for that was to actually borrow one from a friend 30 kilometres away. 
which shows you what we're dealing with. We don't know what the, this future holds really because COVID has done so much disruption to development. But we're going across to find out how he's going basically. And once he's, we're there and we find out how he's going, then we'll see if there's any way that we can support him and give them what they need to just do their mission. Because their heart is for mission, and I think we have learnt if someone's heart is for mission, that's the best starting point. And the second starting point is that they have prayer behind them. The rest will happen. And we'll have a little bit of time to pray later on in our prayers for others to include you in our prayer time. The computer still works. Good morning. Good morning, Robert. Let's hear our call to worship today. Come and let us worship the Lord, the God of Abraham, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us seek God's justice. Let us wonder at God's mercy and grace. Let us worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our loving parent in heaven, we come to worship you. We gather as your people, and we seek your kingdom and its outworking among us, yearning for the world's sufficiency, searching for peace and harmony, justice and fairness. To you, our God, we come. We come to worship. Amen. Let's sing together, Seek, O Seek the Lord. God are the centre of our being, the plumb line by which we measure our lives. For you are God of all, and all are your children. You are the promise of what is right, the measure of what is wrong. You're the teacher of love, respect and understanding. In you we have sufficiency and more. It is you, O oh God, we worship. It is you and your ways that we adore. It is you and your giving that shows us how to live our lives. Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, our prayers we have offered, words spoken, sometimes well spoken, sometimes confused, thoughts turned and feelings felt. But all of this is nothing if we've not lived out those yearnings of our prayer. All of this is nothing if we do not turn our prayers into action. In petition and in sorrow, we offer now our lives to you, seeking to know your forgiveness, desiring to live by your way. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our words, dear God, are so often hollow and empty. Your words are full and forever. Your word promises to forgive us. It assures us of our freedom from past sin and failing. Let us hear now your word and be set free to live our lives for you. Psalm 85. Lord, you were favourable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath and you turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and the righteous will look down from the sky. 
and the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and will make a path for his steps. The Gospel, Luke 11, 1 to 13. He was praying in a certain place, and after he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you, say, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me, the door has already been locked, and my children are in bed with me. He cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you? If your child asks for a fish, that you'll give them a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, we'll give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, Thanks be to God. Do you have a favourite version of the Lord's Prayer? I'm sure you do. Do you know, even at the nursing home, when it looks like half the people are sitting there fast asleep, you start doing the Lord's Prayer and they can say it with you. I'm not sure what the next generation will be like, but the one now, they can do it. Many of them have their favourite version, and some of them are quite adamant that it must be trespasses, not sins, in the prayer. But they know the prayer, and they've been doing it for years. I was surprised to see the age of this book, and the language really is quite obvious that it's old. But it's a great little illustrative book about the prayer, it has parts of the prayer and then a little story underneath with an image that kind of tells what's happening in the prayer. So that you could teach children how to say the Lord's Prayer from that book. Today we hear Luke's version. Only a couple of verses. Matthew's version is a bit longer and a bit more flowery, and that's the one we'll use later on during the service. But it's got all the important bits in it. I wonder who taught you to pray? Do you remember? And how? How did they teach you? Did you have a set prayer at night time? Again, I didn't do this myself, and I'm glad now, but I didn't have to kneel down next to my bed when I was young, and now I couldn't kneel anyway because I couldn't get up. But some of the people in nursing homes, again, you see them kneeling next to their bed to do a prayer, as if that's the only way we can pray. But for some people, that's how it is. It's a bit like that other image of kneeling before the duck. It's a humbleness of heart that brings them into prayer. 
But if you think about it, who taught you to pray? And was there a set prayer or was it just a, ch a chat to a friend kind of prayer? I think times have changed so that it's a bit more of a chat kind of prayer these days. One of the readers I was looking at, his name was James Wallace, comes from the Catholic tradition. He said his mother taught him daily prayers from a small book that had special prayers in it and she would refer to the good Lord who knows best. He also said his second father used to work for a gas company. He said he would often sit and have lunch in a church in the back pew and have a chat to the man upstairs. Occasionally, people even wander in here off the street in order to try to pray. I didn't get to go to a Catholic school, but I tell you what, when you have a look at the curriculum of the Catholic school at Unity College, I looked it up to be sure, there's about a list this long of points about prayer that they're learning through their years. It starts at prep, goes right through to year 12. And they will learn prayer, about prayer, how to pray, and then do it in the classroom and do it at events as well. They have liturgies, whole school liturgies together. And it's not just a chat to God kind of prayers. There's all sorts of prayers that they're learning about. Rituals of prayer. Meditation prayers, symbolic prayer, music prayers, all sorts of prayer. They even have a sacred space in their classrooms. And some of them are amazing. The things they've collected and put together on their little table as a focus point for prayer. They're trying to teach or develop their devotional life throughout their time at school. And I find that's amazing. We did a little bit when I was in Sunday school, but I'm sure we did nothing like all of that that they've learned at school. Hopefully some of it will stick as they get older. Now many of you have prayed a lot more than I have and a lot more persistently, probably, regularly. Some people even get a parking space when they're looking for one. <laughs> Did you know there's a Catholic prayer for that? Holy Mary, Mother of Grace, grant to me a parking space. <laughs> I didn't know that one until I heard it at the school, but it works for them. <laughs> there's all kinds of different prayer. And I think perhaps Uniting Church is a bit stuck in one kind. But because I've dabbled with some of the other areas of prayer, if you like, particularly at retreats, I think, I'm much more interested in things like silent prayer. I'm going to a retreat day in a couple of weeks and it's about art prayer. We'll be there for the whole day and we'll collect things or paint things or read readings and then draw something or paint something that reflects from that reading. And that's a sort of prayer. Some prayers also involve reading a scripture and then praying with that scripture. Some of them you read the scripture and put yourself in the story. Some of you are on the prayer chain, so you get messages about things to pray for, so that all of the people of the church can pray together. And we will have community prayer here this morning. There's a prayer of examine that helps us to reflect back over the week. How has your life been this week in your connection with God? And if you're into apps, I can show you some good apps about prayer and reflection, contemplation. There's some really beauties. 
They put together music, Bible readings, and someone speaking the word into that story. Some people like to journal and reflect upon their life and their scripture and how that can become a prayer. There's all sorts of different ways of praying. As we looked at today's scripture, the disciples were asking Jesus, how do we pray? Teach us to pray. And when you read back over Luke's gospel, even if we just focus on Luke, there are instances of Jesus praying in all sorts of situations. I've got a long list of scripture references, but I'll just pick out a few instances of them. He prayed at his baptism. When the dove came down and landed on him, he was praying. He withdrew to the desert to a quiet place to pray. He went up to the mountain to pray. He spent the night in prayer with God. He often got up early and went away by himself to pray. He prayed with the crowds around him. He prayed when he blessed the food and made enough for 5,000 to share. He prayed on the mountain when he met with God and his face glowed and became dazzling white. He prayed the night before he died. He prayed on the cross. Prayer was a part of his life day to day, particularly when he was trying to make a decision, when things were tough. And I think that's probably the time we notice it the most as well that we need extra help, and who can we ask? It's the divine presence of God that is with us, not just the man upstairs, but God who is with us in our everyday life, wherever we are, whatever our story. Have a think about who do you pray to? What sort of image of God do you think about? Imagine as you go, as you pray. Is it the same old words? Some people have a family grace that they use over and over. Some people just say thank you. Help me. Help us. There's all sorts of ways of praying. The idea of kneeling before God, coming before God in humbleness, asking God to give us what we need, forgive us for the things we've done wrong, lead us into whatever the future might hold, and deliver us from danger, whether it be trespasses or sins, whatever the danger, lead us, deliver us. They're the sorts of prayers that Luke is trying to teach us about. There's another good sentence that I found, I thought. Is it not a pretty drastic application of Jesus' warning to avoid unnecessary wordiness and the kind of dissemblance practiced by hypocrites and heathens who think that we'll be heard because of their many words? Keep them short. Don't ramble on and on. God knows it already. Just us asking God for what we need. All sorts of prayer. And I can't tell you how to make sure they're answered. We've been praying for world peace for some time and it still doesn't appear to be happening. But I think we still keep praying. Sometimes we pray for family members for a long time too. And sometimes we can't see what's happening for them. But I've heard lots of stories of people that do tell. Many years later, something's changed and they believe that someone was praying for them. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened.
Just do it. Amen. Let's sing. What a friend we have in Jesus. It's another good one you'll need to know at the nursing home. <laughs> Beloved 
of God, you have been healed and forgiven. God has poured out God's love upon you, that you may be faithful disciples, offering healing love and forgiveness to all. Go in peace, and may God's peace always be with you. Amen. Amen. Yeah.